Lord. Gloire à Dieu. I understand the choir that is supposed to sing. They're still on their way. But because this program is a global program, and all the leaders and all the workers and ministers and uh, all the people who are participating, the professionals in all the countries of the world, they are ready for this time. We love the choir coming to sing, but we cannot wait. They'll have their chance the other days of the program. It may not be their fault that they are not here now, but we love them, we bless everyone, and the administration, the Lord will use to, bring, uh, to bless us during this program, in Jesus' name. And for those of you who are here, we well, praise the Lord for you. The Lord is going to turn your life and family and ministry around for the better in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this moment. We bless your name for who you are. You have chosen us. You have brought us into the ministry. And you want us to succeed. I pray that you empower every participant to succeed in ministry in Jesus' name. Equip everyone. Empower everyone. Engage everyone in the ministry of the word that will bring souls into the kingdom in Jesus' name. We know you have answered. It will be done. And we'll see the evidence in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Aren't you hear a good, good amen? God bless everyone. You can sit down. As we begin our ministers and professional conference this time, And we're talking about the desire of God, the decision of God, the decree of God to empower, energize, equip every minister for wonders in ministry. He has revealed his mind to us. What he wants for you. What he wants for me. And I pray this revelation as we review it again will be fulfilled in your life and fulfilled in every life. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And you said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. That's the Lord Almighty. The God of power, the God of all possibilities. Talking to Paul the Apostle. A minister like you, like me. There were difficulties in the way. There were challenges in the way. And there were things that could have made him stop. Things that could have turned him around. Things could have made him say, it's enough. I can't bear that anymore. I can't move on anymore. He actually prayed about it. Uh, there, there, was, there were challenges buffeting him. Whatever the challenges were, 
they were so big and so great and so traumatizing that he had to go to God in prayer and say this is painful this is pressurizing this is not convenient or comfortable he prayed once no answer the buffeting still continued the challenges still continued and the difficulties still continued he prayed the second time no change no answer no ease of the situation and he prayed the third time and now God answered and the answer was not to take away the buffeting whenever we pray for a problem to be removed the Lord answers in two ways number one he can remove the mountain, the load, and the pressure. That's one way to answer. Number two, the second way to answer is to strengthen our shoulder to bear the body. Number two, it is to strengthen our backbone to be stronger so we can bear the load and carry the load. Number two, it is to strengthen our mind so that we have the courage of mind and we have the ability to take whatever blow may be coming. And so God answered the prayer of Paul by strengthening his shoulder to bear the load strengthen the backbone to stand in the midst of the challenges making the mind strong courageous most uh, stronger than the buffeting coming upon him and so this is the answer of the Lord that we are reading from God to Paul the Apostle. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee. There is salvation. My grace is sufficient for your salvation. There is sanctification and holiness. My grace is sufficient. No matter your temptation, no matter the environment where you live, my grace is sufficient for your, say, for your sanctification and holiness. When the wind is blowing this way and that way, and all the trees of the field that wave in this way and that way. And the strong people are collapsing. My grace is sufficient for steadfastness. That in the midst of the wind, in the midst of the whirlwind, God answers and he says, My grace is sufficient for steadfastness. In the service the Lord has called us to. When the demand of the service is greater than our former strength. And he will say this thing is much more than I ever thought. The pebbles and the way are turning to thorns in the way. The slope. The, uh, the climbing is a kind of steep, more steep I was than I was prepared for. And then we pray about it. It says, my grace is sufficient for your service. 
Therefore, the grace of God is available. Wherever we are, whatever we are called to do, my grace is sufficient for thee. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul stopped praying about the buffeting. He said, now I expect it. Now I don't just endure, endure I enjoy it. God knows about it. I know about it. We both know about it. Heaven knows about it. Earth knows about it. I'm all right. And then he accepted that. He expected that. He enjoyed that. That's why he now says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, Therefore, because of what God has said, Therefore, because his grace is sufficient for me, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in criticism, in the problems of those who reproach me. It says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. It says, when the thing that should weaken me, when they come to me, I become stronger. When the thing that drove other people away from ministry, and they give up, and they stop, and they say, I can't continue. The body is too much. The contradictions are too many. It says, they are weak, therefore they quit. But because of what God told me, when I am weak, I don't quit. I continue. Actually now, become strengthened by the things that should weaken me. He said, for when I am weak, then at the same time, am I strong? It means what things on earth come to weaken me, heaven responds and pause, blessing upon my life that heaven makes me strong. What was the secret? How did he do this? The strength came. Power came. Grace was multiplied. At the time when he should have been so weak in, he should have dropped the ball. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Psychology will not make it. Earthly help will not make it. Human promise will not make it. Dependence on man or woman, dependence on the flesh will not make it. It's the strength in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
in verse 11 it says put on the whole armor of God the armor of man will not make it you can have the greatest encouragement on earth that will not make it you can have a human coach that coaches other people in secular matters to coach you that will not make it put on the whole armor of god that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil that's the secret you get the secret today you rely on the god of heaven you will be strong to the month, be amen. We will be strong in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you today on making the weak strong in ministry. Making the weak strong. Are you weak? That's not a strange thing. You're a human being doing a heavenly thing. You'll be weak. Your spirit, soul, and body, flesh, and spirit, and you are confronting Satan, who is diabolical and spiritual. We understand you're weak. Your body is not stone. Your mind is not stone. Your endurance is limited. You are weak. Moses was weak. But he finished strong. Elijah was weak. But he finished strong. Gideon expressed his weakness. But he overcame. And then you come to the New Testament. And Paul the Apostle said, Fight is without and fears within. They were weak. Peter was weak. And he said, I don't know the man. And yet heaven smiled on all of them and he finished strong. Whatever your weakness, whatever your difficulty, from today, power, strength, authority. If you can look away from the past, don't borrow the experience of the past to fetch you plan the future. We human beings are agents and carriers of history. And we allow history to destroy prophecy. We allow the past to spoil the future. We borrow the tears of the past and we send that ahead so that when I get to that place again, I will cry again. We borrow the failure of the past to spoil the success of the future. That's why God said, remember not the former things. The former fears, the former weakness, the former crumbling and falling, the former backsliding, the former giving up, forget the former things. He says, I will do a new thing. 
forget the past don't borrow the past to plan the future they were all weak but they finished strong I will finish strong let heaven hear your voice let God hear your voice that you are not trusting your human strength you are trusting in divine power put on the whole armor of God now I understand when I failed in the past I didn't have on the whole armor of God If you were defeated in the past, I know the secret. You didn't put on the whole armor of God. If situations or circumstances put your back on the ground in the past, you are not putting on the whole armor of God. you are trying to do spiritual thing with your human knowledge human strength that's why we failed in the past the future is greater than the past and what makes the future greater is that now we put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. Making the weak strong in the ministry. We're looking at three things here. Number one, trusting the same Christ of yesteryears in you. The same Christ in you. You know the difference between us and the people in the gospel time? Christ was not in them. When they were in the boat, he was in the boat but wasn't inside Peter. When they had any challenge, here was Christ. He's gone to the mountain top to pray. He was their savior, but he wasn't living inside them. But now, when we get saved, it says, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. It says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in into him. Now, he that lives in you is greater than he that is in the world. The same Christ. But now he lives inside us. Trust him in the same Christ of yesteryears in you. Number two. Toiling a servant cultivators with his yoke upon you. His yoke is the thing that is now on us. He has taken the yoke of the world away. He has taken the yoke of Satan away. The yoke of Satan is irksome, is heavy, is terrible. 
the yoke of man that they put some people even after you are born again somebody can put their yoke their pressure and their load and their ideas and control upon you the yoke and the control of man of woman is heavy You cannot even please yourself. You have to please them. You cannot enjoy what you are doing without their smile. The control of man, the control of woman, the yoke of man, the yoke of woman is heavy. It's like you carry a bag of cement on your back and you are turning to run a race. You can't run very well. But he takes the yoke of man away. He takes the yoke of a woman away. And he says, come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is not heavy. It is easy. My body is light. Now you are toiling a servant cultivators with his yoke upon you. Imagine when I was toiling. I told a little in my father's farm. And then if I had a bag of cement on my back and I was cultivating, that would be terrible. That would be difficult. Now you toil your father's field. If you have the yoke of a man, the yoke of a woman on you, that's why we're slow. That's why we're slow. We think much of the pain we have than the toiling, the work we have to do. That slows us down. But when you are free from the yoke of any man on earth, any woman on earth, and now you toil as a servant is cultivator, a time of enjoying the service of God has come in your life. Number three, teaching the second coming with earnestness and uh, youthfulness. You are earnest about it. And you are useful about it. The strength of the youth. The power of the youth. The youthfulness and the earnestness that we have. We toil and teach like that. But you know something? Uh, we're teaching the second coming. And we're enjoying uh, the product and the fruit of the first coming. Look at all the provision of the first coming. If you have not earned that, got that, enjoyed that, how can you freely and fully teach the benefits of the second coming? We're teaching, we're instructing on the benefits of the second coming because we join the result of the first coming. Look at number one. Number one is trusting the same Christ of yesteryears who now lives in you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. 
The same in power. The same in love. The same in equipping the people that he sends forth. Jesus Christ the same. As he was with Peter, so he is with you. It's the same in impartiality. It's the same in empowering us. It's the same in equipping us. It's the same in the promises he has given. It's the same in the power that he manifests. Jesus Christ. The same Savior. The same sanctifier. The same healer. The same redeemer. The same deliverer. The same in mercy. The same in no discrimination. Whether you are coming from the upland country nation or you are coming to from a down below nation, Christ, the same, no partiality. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Who sanctified Enoch and made him holy. Who sanctified Samuel and made him faultless. Who sanctified Peter and he became a stone savers and became a rock steady and stable and steadfast. Who sanctified Paul and made him holy, righteous, without any blame. The same Jesus who has not changed, who always empowers his people. And he said, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. And then in verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him. He provided salvation. If anybody is not saved, it's because he has not gone forth unto him outside the camp. He is the sanctifier that purifies us and purges us and makes us to have victory, triumph over all the offshoots of the tree of depravity. If we're not sanctified, it's because we have not gone forth unto him outside the camp. He is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. He is our power. He is our triumph. He is all in all with, for us. If we don't have the power of the Holy Ghost, it's because we have not gone to him outside the camp. He is the ever-living one living in our heart and thinking the thoughts of God, not the thoughts of man. If the thoughts of man, if they are disturbing our mind and we don't have the thoughts of God in agreement with God, you know why? It's because we have not gone forth unto him without the calm. I, Im I invite you to this same Christ that is able to do all this. What he had done before is able to do in our very lives. 
let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach now I understand if I'm not willing to bear his reproach I cannot possess his righteousness If I'm not willing to bear his reproach, I cannot enjoy his full redemption. If I'm always thinking of what people say about me, what they think about me, and how they put me down, they belittle me, and how I am reproached because of him, if I'm always thinking of that, I cannot bear and also possess his sanctification and holiness. Bearing his reproach. Satan will jest. I don't care. The followers of Satan will blame. I don't worry. Weak flesh of other people. Who does he think he is? I don't mind. It is that willingness to bear his reproach that makes him a savior, a sanctifier, our healer, a redeemer, a deliverer, our all-sufficient one. We're looking at John chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 10. John 14, verse 10. Believest thou that I am in the Father? And the Father in me? Think about that. He was on earth. The Father was in heaven. Millions of miles separated them in the physical. And yet the Father in heaven is in me. And the Son on earth is in him. Why am I pointing out that? We are now on earth. Christ is in heaven heavenly and yet as it works with the father and the son it works with the believer the minister and Christ our Lord he is in heaven we on earth we on earth he is in heaven and yet he lives in us. And we live in him. Believest thou that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What's the evidence that there is that interpenetration? He says, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not my words, but the Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. When we speak his word, he confirms that word by doing his work through us. He is in us. We are in him. And then in verse 11, it says, Believe me that I am in the Father. And the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very world's sake. He opened the eyes of the blind. Because the father was in him. He made the lame to rise up and walk. The father was in him. 
he spoke before Pilate words of courage when they were going to crucify him the father was in him the pharisees and the pharisees they wanted to make life difficult for him but he endured it all in such a gallant victorious triumphant way the, the persecution did not mean anything to him why the father was in him He did what no other man had ever done. Because the Father was in him. If you're full of yourself, and you don't have Christ living inside you, all you can think about is your knowledge you're full of yourself. All you can think about is what you learned when those things they wrote were the chalk on the board. And that's all you have. That's not enough. Victory does not come that way. If you're full of all that you have read in books, in libraries, that's, that's what fills your heart. And Christ is not present, preeminent and prominent there in your heart. We cannot win the victory we're looking for. The Father lived in him. And now he lives within us. Hey, look at verse 12. Verily, verily, then I say unto you, He that believeth on me, you believe on him for salvation. And there is no iota of doubt in your heart. He is my Savior. He lives in me as Savior. You believe in him as your sanctifier, your purifier, your refiner, and he lives in you as sanctifier. You believe in him and the power of heaven that lives and abides in you. He that believeth on me. You believe in him as the all-sufficient one. The master of angels and men. The one that crushed and conquered the devil. The one that sends the God of this world packing. You believe in him at the ultimate power all power in heaven and on earth is given unto him and you believe in him that he lives in you as a conqueror he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he also do why? Because he did all his works by the Father living inside him. And we do all the work by the unfailing Christ dwelling inside us. Have you noticed when you drink a cold water? And that cold water entices you. You see, you know, you feel that water, it has reached that place, it has reached that place. And when it settles, the coolness and the freshness of where that water gets to, you know it and you feel it. You're, you're conscious where that cold water has gone. The same thing when you drink tea, hot tea, or hot liquid, and you take it in, 
as the hot liquid tea or coffee is moving there, you know the place where it has got into. When Christ lives in you, you are as conscious in your mind, in your soul, in your heart. Christ lives there. And you trust him because this same Christ lives in you. The same Christ of yesteryears abides in you. You know that because of that, through him who lives and abides in you, it says, the works that I do shall ye also do. And greater works than this shall he do. Because I go unto my father. Why? Because I go unto my father. He's now with the father. And he's talking to the father about you. He says, that's my disciple. That's the minister I sent out. That's a man, that's a woman serving me. Look, father, look at me inside him. Look, Father, look at me inside her. My desire is his desire. My work is his work. My service is her appointment. It's always mentioning my name. It's conscious that I live on the inside of him. He goes to the Father. He sees with the Father talking about you all the time to the Father. He's going everywhere. He's doing what I told him to do. His concentration, his passion is my desire. And he wants to glorify me every time. The, the Son is always talking about you to the Father. That's why when you come to pray, you are not a stranger to heaven. When you come to minister, you are not a stranger to heaven. And the works that I do, he shall do. Because I go unto my father. The provision you need, you tell him, you're not talking to a far away savior, you're talking to a savior nearby, he lives in your heart. Some people say their prayers don't go beyond the ceiling. Well, you don't need ceiling. It's right there inside you. And what you are thinking and what you are praying, what you are interceding is on the inside of you. It's listening to you. It's transferring that to the Father's attention. That's what gives you power. That's why the weakness of the flesh does not affect your soul, your spirit. That same Jesus lives on the inside of you today. You are stronger in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 4 verse 4. First John chapter 4 verse 4. Ye are of God little children. Little children. Ah, am I am a man. I'm in my 70s. I am a woman. I'm not a little child. I am in my 50s. Yeah, of God, little children. For somebody who is a thousand years old, somebody who is 80 years old is a little child. 
For somebody who is 2,000 years old, 10,000 years old, somebody who is 100 years of age is a little child. For Christ, who had been from all eternity, millions and millions of years of existence. If somebody who is uh, ten, who is uh, seventy years old, eighty years old, is a little child. It's not John talking to us. The scripture was not authorized or authored or inspired by John. It's the Holy Ghost that inspired the Bible. And the only ghost that inspired the Bible has been from all eternity, millions and millions and millions of years. And so the Holy Spirit says, you're a little child. There's something about little children. Whatever we tell them, that's what they believe. You tell a little child, you see, you have intestine. And when you eat, it goes to your intestine. And the child cannot see the intestine in the mirror. But daddy told me, what I eat goes into my intestine. You tell everybody, I have intestine. If we, as we believe as little children, and the Holy Ghost says, Greater is he that is inside you than he that is in the world. We have evidence of the one in the world. But we don't have the picture of the one inside us. And all the pictures we take, the camera cannot detect the one that lives on the inside of us. All the x-ray we do, the x-ray cannot detect the one inside us. X-ray does not discover spirit. But the eternal one says, Ye have got little children and have overcome them. We have not even finished fighting the battle and we have overcome them. Christ fought the battle for me, He overcame. His victory is counted, that is my victory. And so he overcame. Look at that, look at that. I have overcome them all. You didn't say amen for yourself. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. As a little child believes the papa, the mama, the teacher, I believe the Holy Ghost. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Do you believe? Do you believe that? Everywhere you go now, you don't fear those things outside because the one inside you has conquered and his victory is reckoned to your account. We're looking at number two now. Toiling as servant cultivators with his yoke upon you. Something about the yoke. 
you cannot bear the yoke of two farmers, two cultivators at the same time. Look at all those animals, the yoke together. Someone has that yoke. Someone put that yoke on that ox. And once somebody comes and he finds there's a yoke there. They cannot put a different yoke, another yoke on those cultivating animals. We come to Christ by our our volition by our decision we repent and we turn to the Lord we disown we reject the former master that had a yoke on us and because that's a decision and God honors the choice that his creature makes We have turned away from our sin. We turn away from Satan. We turn away from the world. And we announce that. We declare that. We make it public. And so we remove the yoke of the former master. Now we come to Christ. And he puts his yoke upon us. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. Not take our yoke upon you. The yoke of Christ and the yoke of Satan. Uh-uh. He is Antichrist. You are for Christ. You cannot have the yoke of Christ and the yoke of Antichrist all upon you. You cannot have the yoke of the Messiah and the yoke of man upon you at the same time. You cannot take the yoke of the wonder-walking Christ on you and the yoke of a woman upon you at the same time. You reject every other yoke. You reject every other control. You reject every other master on earth. And he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest for your soul unto your souls. Look at verse 30. For my yoke is easy. You know, sometimes when you, when you have a yoke upon you, like you see those animals in the picture. If the yoke is too tight, if the person that puts the yoke is thinking of himself or herself, and not thinking of your ease and peace and comfort. the yoke can become uncomfortable and all you are thinking about you are not thinking about the cultivation about the service about the work you are doing you are thinking of the pain on your neck but when Christ puts his yoke upon you he's conscious of your pain he's conscious of your ease he makes the yoke to size your personality. He makes the yoke to align with the duty and the work and the service he has given you. 
He thinks of your experience and inexperience. He thinks of your emotion and your feeling. And he also gives you the grace with the yoke. With the leadership, with the control. And you'll find when you take his yoke upon you without any extra yoke from anybody else. For my yoke is easy and my body is light. And, and with that yoke upon you, you can farm anywhere he appoints you to farm. You can cultivate anywhere he calls you to, uh, to cultivate. And you can do and you can uh, draw a straight line, not a crooked line, as you are plowing. And that yoke will never go blunt. The thing, the tools you are using will be plowing, will be sowing, will be reaping. And life will be easy for you because my yoke is easy and my body is light. From today, you'll find that a personal experience in your life in Jesus' name. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 verse 3. <laughs> Let nothing be done through strife of being glory. I'm sure you've seen uh, those two animals that are yoked together and they are pulling uh, uh, the machine that will cultivate behind them. If those two animals bearing the yoke, if they start strive or pride or vainglory, the work will stop. If we have canal comparison, the work will stop. If we have canal competition, the work will stop. Let nothing be done through strife or pride of inglory. But in lowliness of mind, the Christ who has put the yoke on us to cultivate is lowly and meek. In lowliness of mind, let each other, let each esteem other better than themselves. When we think we're higher than everybody else, that's pride. That's not humility. When we strive with other workers, other leaders, other church leaders, it's because we think his work is not important, his church is not important, his ministry is not important, mine is the most important. If they don't do anything, if they fail, it doesn't matter. If I succeed, that's all Christ needs. That's a lie, that's not true. But that's why people strive. When we think like that, we are not sanctified. Whatever we do, if we do not follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord, and we're striving and we're proud and we're vain glory, we cannot get to heaven if we die in that condition.
Follow peace, follow peace. Strife does not come into the cultivators who are plowing for the kingdom of God. You are not plowing for the kingdom of man. Strife does not come in. When you are not serving yourself, you are not plowing for yourself, you are not cultivating for yourself, you are cultivating for God and God alone. If we spend part of our strength in strife and vain glory, you don't have a complete strength anymore to serve the Lord. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Look not every man on his own things. Let no man think of his own joy, his own desires, his own, I want, I want, I want. I want to feel good. I want to feel joy. He says, we should not think about that. Leave that in the hands of God. Come under the yoke of Christ. Let him be the leader, the controller of all your actions. Look not every man, every woman on his own things, on her own things. But every man, every woman also on the things of others. Edify others. Build up others. Comfort others. Strengthen others. Don't think about yourself. God is thinking of you. He sent you forth for a ministry. Think only of the ministry of ministry to others. And then in verse 5, in verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you. Let. That, that word let. Give me a chance. Let me enter. Give me a chance. Don't tie me down. Let me go. Do not block me. Open the door. Let me in. Let. Let. It's making use of your voluntary action and voluntary thinking and voluntary decision. Let this mind be in you. Don't allow another kind of mind to hinder the fullness of the mind of Christ in you. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. In the mind of love, the mind of lowliness, the mind of meekness, the mind of eagerness to serve the Lord, the mind of not thinking of yourself, but thinking of the good of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the thing that makes us successful and powerful in the work of the kingdom of God. I pray the Lord will implant that in every heart. Hebrews chapter 12. Reading verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. 
Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It says we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. He's talking about chapter 11. Enoch. Abel. Noah. Abraham. Sarah. Abraham again, think of him. Isaac. Jacob. All those people that are listed in chapter 11. They had the might of Christ. Christ had not yet come, but they exhibited, they demonstrated the might of Christ. All by faith. By the faith of the one that is coming. And they lived a life pleasing unto God. He says, now that we have such a cloud of witnesses around us. And he says, there is no problem you will ever face which had not been faced by one of those people in chapter 11. He said, there's no other challenge that will confront you, which had not confronted one of those people in chapter 11. He said, because of that, and they laid aside everything that will stop them. He says, let us lay aside every weight. What's the weight? It's something that presses you down when you're thinking of yourself. Oh, me. Why should this happen to me? Why should that happen to Abraham? When you're thinking of yourself, I want elevation. I want, yeah, I want people to even exaggerate my virtue. That's, that's a wage. I want this from people. I want that from people. That's a wage. It weighs you down. Because we cannot read your mind. We don't know what you want. We don't know what you are thinking about. And so we may not be able to fulfill the desires and the aspirations you have. And as you look at the world, and they're not uh, singing your praises, your heart begins to sink. You forget the evaluation of God, the exaltation of God, and those things you think about yourself, the way you don't throw it off. And the sin that does so easily besets us. The sin that easily besets us. Oh, people are thinking of that sin, that sin, that sin. The greatest sin in our lives is putting ourselves first and Christ behind. The greatest thing of our lives, putting our own desires first, behind we have the desires of Christ. All the other sins are because of our desires. Alcohol, because of our desires. Adultery, fornication, because of our desires. Yielding to the flesh because of our desires. Fighting and strife. Because what I want was not given to me. It's a desire that brings that. And a sin that does so, so easily beset us. 
it's because we put our desires what i want what i love what i demand we put that before in front of the desires of christ it says we should brush that aside all the sin that not so easily beset us and then let us run and I can't find a runner that is running and is looking back and looking sideways and looking what did I eat this morning what did I eat last night he's thinking of that he cannot run well It's when you put all of self away from your life. You die to sin. You die to self. You die to the flesh. You die to human desire. Now you can run the race that is set before you. Christ will be big in your heart. Mighty in your life. And Christ will be supernatural in your life. You're thinking of him and him alone. You're not thinking of self. That one is buried. Then in verse 2. It says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. If you don't see the crown ahead of you, you'll be bogged down, pinched down by the pain of the cross you bear today. If you're not looking at the future, the coronation of the future, the reward of the future, the joy in eternity, the temporary cross you are bearing now will be so heavy that you will not move on because you are looking at your day, you are not looking at eternity. He endured the cross in despite the shame. And now he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God can give you grace to manage everything that comes your way in life. He will give you grace. He will give you strength. He will give you joy. Now you will discover how to laugh when you in the same situation you have been weeping in the past. How to be happy when in the same situation you have been so sorrowful and sad in the past. And the grace to move on the Lord will give unto you. Unto me. Where are you? He will give unto you in Jesus' name. Uh, look at verse 28 there. It says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Christ was looking forward to the time he will be on the throne. And now he tells us we should look at the time we'll be on the throne. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace saving grace let us have grace sanctifying grace let us have grace sufficient grace 
whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We're coming to point number three now. We're teaching the second coming with yearning and usefulness. He came before he landed on the cross. He is coming again. He's coming with a crown. He came before to save. He is coming again to take us from the earth to heaven. He came before. He came to suffer. He came to heal. He came to bear our body. He is coming again. So that it's not bearing a body, it's taking us away from the body of the world. We enjoy the provision of the first coming. And now we rejoice in the fact of the second coming. Teach the second coming. But have you taught the first coming? That he came to save, he came to heal, he came to deliver, he came to set free, he came to crush the devil, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Have you taught that? Do you have any right to teach the second coming if you are not teaching the first coming? That he came to set us free. If the Son shall therefore set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Do you believe what has happened already? If you don't believe what has happened in the first coming, can you truly believe what is going to happen at the second coming? He healed the sick at the first coming. It's going to resurrect the dead at the second coming. The miracle of resurrection is greater than the miracle of healing. Can you believe the resurrection of all the dead for thousand, for two thousand years or more, and that it will resurrect them from all over the world? A great miracle. Can you say you believe that resurrection at his second coming? If you don't believe the healing of individuals at the first coming. At the first coming, he destroyed the works of the devil. At the second coming, rapture, tribulation. Then the second coming, it will chain the devil and will chain and put him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years during the millennial reign. If you don't believe the destruction of the work of the devil at the first coming, can you truly believe the chaining of the devil for a thousand years at the second coming? We must, we must proclaim. We must teach. Everything he accomplished at the first coming. And we shouldn't think there are some things there unbelievable and, you know, undeniable. Are you going to teach the second coming and the great, great things, supernatural things that will take place at the, se at the second coming?
the Lord is coming again. I believe the Lord is coming again. And in the meantime, you enjoy what he did at the first coming. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. In Acts chapter 1 verse 9. It says, and when he has spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. He was taken up by an invisible hand, by a supernatural power. The law of gravity suspended. And there was no ladder. There was no aeroplane. He was taken up. It happened to Enoch. It, he was taken up. It happened to Elijah. He was taken up. It's going to happen to all true believers at the rapture. Taken up. While they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. In verse 10, and while they looked steadfast toward heaven, that's, that's where he went. When Enoch was taken up, he went to heaven. When Elijah was taken up, he went into heaven. When Christ was taken up, they looked up steadfast into heaven. When we're taken up at the end of our time of the period of the church, taken up to heaven. As he went, as he went up, behold, two men stood by, so by them in white apparel. In verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus was the print of nails in his hand, was the piercing of his side, with those nail prints on the feet. This same Jesus that rose the third day. This same Jesus that has brought redemption through his blood. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven. Those angels that appear to them said, Christ, like Enoch, like Elijah, was taken up into heaven. And shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He went to heaven, he's coming back again. I said, He's coming back again. Because the word of God says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We shall be changed, and this corruption shall put on incorruption. He says there'll be a sound from heaven of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It may be at morn. It may be at noon. 
it may be at night and Christ will come and take us away we don't know when it will be but it will be and we know it's only those who follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. They'll be the people that will enjoy that coming of the Lord that will be taken up with the other saints. When the saints go marching in, not when the sinners go marching in. Not when the backsliders go marching in. Not when the violent people, fighting people go marching in. When the saints go marching in, we will be over them. And we teach our congregations that. We teach every listener that. So that they can maintain that relationship with God. That when the saints go marching in, you will be among them. They will come any time from now. You will be among the people that will go with him. Let me hear your amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Teach it, preach it, live it, believe it, live by that understanding Christ can come anytime. And keep on walking with God and walking for God now in an acceptable manner with saving grace, sanctifying grace, sufficient grace in your life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord.